In 2020, the United States of America saw its largest and most widespread protests since, and possibly including, the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Now, protest songs are as old as picket lines, and jazz has been part of that history as well, despite it being a primarily instrumental genre. Here are a few of those stories. G'day, I'm Tim. I make videos about jazz history. Please subscribe if you're new. As you probably know, jazz was primarily an African-American art form, and so the civil rights movement of the 1960s was particularly important to the people that made the music. At that time, you probably associate protest songs with the white hippies of Woodstock, but I would argue that African-American musicians may have had a little bit more to deal with in terms of systemic racism and whatnot. I mention that because a couple of the songs on this list are explicitly out of and in response to the civil rights movement. I'm no expert on that particular part of history, so I'll leave some links in the description. The first entry on our list is an entire album from the drummer Max Roach. We insist, Max Roach's Freedom Now Sweet is a pretty avant-garde release from 1960, made in collaboration with the lyricist Oscar Brown, although a few creative differences saw Brown leave the project before it was recorded. The album also heavily features Abby Lincoln, a vocalist who herself was very much involved in the civil rights movement, and her performances are probably the, the most deeply impactful. The first side of the album explores the journey of African Americans from pre-slavery to um, the modern civil rights movement. The other side of the album, side B, goes to Africa and explores civil rights movements there, especially around the 1960 Sharpeville massacre in South Africa. It's an extremely raw and emotional album and a tough listen, but it's a tough subject, so it's well worth your time. The second jazz protest song on our list comes from Charles Mingus's incredible album, Ah Um, the song being Fables of Forbes. So Fables of Forbes was a response to the Little Rock Crisis of 1957, where Arkansas Governor Orville Forbes refused to comply with the Supreme Court ruling Brown v. Board of Education, which ended segregation in US schools. Forbes ordered the State National Guard to essentially blockade Little Rock Central High School and refuse African-American students entry. It took the president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, to send in the army to escort the black students into school before the crisis was even somewhat resolved. So yeah, Forbes was a real piece of work. And Charles Mingus wasn't the only jazz musician who spoke out against him. Louis Armstrong historically broke his silence on political matters of any sort when he spoke out against Forbes and the Little Rock Crisis. Armstrong did an interview in the middle of the crisis and he got justifiably upset about what was going on. He said something to the effect of, it's almost like a colored man hasn't got any country anymore. After the interview was published, Armstrong's tour manager tried to water down or, or walk back the comments, but Lewis actually leaned into them in subsequent interviews over the next couple of weeks. And while Armstrong never really got that political again, it sort of marked a bit of a turning point in his career. Speaking of Louis Armstrong, the third song on this list is a bit of a curveball. St. Louis Blues was a signature for Satchmo, but it was also one of the most popular songs in the first half of the 20th century. Even Queen Elizabeth II cited it as one of her favorite ever songs. So it's not the sort of tune that you'd expect to see in a protest. And yet, on two separate occasions, it was used as an anti-fascist anthem. The first of these was in Ethiopia during the Second Italo-Ethiopian War, which happened uh, in the mid-30s, just before World War II broke out. Mussolini's Italian army was invading Ethiopia from the north and the south, and Ethiopian soldiers defending the nation used St. Louis Blues as a battle hymn. But once the war had officially broken out and come to Europe, St. Louis Blues played another role in France. Now, France had been introduced to jazz by American soldiers in the First World War, particularly African-American soldiers, and uh, it had flourished over the subsequent decades between World War I and World War II. One standout jazz musician was Django Reinhardt, the gypsy jazz guitarist, who, in 1937, recorded his own version of St. Louis Blues. Unfortunately, with the entry of America into the war in 1941, the Germans, who were occupying France at the time, banned all American music, including jazz. However, in a very creative response, 
French musicians and historians started spinning this false narrative that jazz was actually from France, that it was a uh, extension of Claude Debussy's work, and that it was actually very sympathetic to the Germans' Eurocentric uh, regime. To help continue this narrative, American jazz songs were given French names and their authors French monikers. Louis Armstrong's French name became Jean Sablon, and the song Saint Louis Blues became known as Tristesse de Saint Louis. It's hard to know how effective this strategy specifically was, but jazz is still strong in Europe today, and this might be part of it. Now, there are many, many more songs that I could have included on this list, but it would have been a very long video. So here are a couple of high profile albums that have their roots in some sort of civil protest. The live albums from the Miles Davis Quintet, Four and More and My Funny Valentine were both recorded on the same night. And none of the songs on these albums are protest songs. In fact, they're just jazz standards. What made these albums special is that they were recorded at an event that was supporting black voter registration. Miles famously angered his entire band that night by just before going on stage telling them that they were going to do the show for free and so wouldn't be paid. Whether or not that anger contributed to it or not, it was an incredible performance. An honourable mention also goes to Pieces of a Man by Gil Scott Heron, and this is required listening for anyone who loves jazz, or hip-hop for that matter. Pieces of a Man was Gil Scott Heron's follow-up to his first live album, Small Talk, at 125th and Lennox, and both albums featured his most famous track, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. The song's title was a popular slogan from the Black Power Movement of the 1960s, and the lyrics speak to the ongoing struggle for black enfranchisement, even after the civil rights movement ended. Now, I didn't include this album or track on the main list because it's borderline not jazz. However, it's probably my favorite album on this list. I'll leave links in the description to all of the songs that I've mentioned in this video. Please check them out. They are all worth listening to. Uh, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed yourself or got something out of this, please like the video and subscribe to the channel so that we can do this again. Here are a couple of other jazz videos that I've made. If you'd like to watch them now, if not, I'll see you next time. Bye. Okay.